Yeah, that is good. Okay, let's just keep it as this is. Alright. Just crop it later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, thanks for coming out again. Um, we are going to be talking about light extraction today. So it's a nice little lead in from light traffic to light extraction. Because all the, the basic physics of these two problems are essentially the same. It's just sort of like going this way instead of that way. Um, so it just makes a nice little sequel to what we talked about last time. So we'll just we'll see a lot of parallels going on here. So for example, what is light extraction? So you remember before we had this idea of light coming in and hitting a thing and some of it would bounce around and get absorbed and others would fall out or reflect away. Now we're just doing the opposite. Light is being emitted somewhere inside of a thing. Oh, thanks. Can you shut that door, please? <clears throat> Light is being emitted here, so there's a photon just bouncing around, and eventually it gets to the surface and leaves the object. Or it might just bounce around a little bit and get reabsorbed and lost. So what we want, what we're interested in, is getting light from in here to out here somewhere. We're going to call that light extraction, or light extraction efficiency. So it's a very simple, straightforward definition. You take all the power, the photon energy that's leaving your thing, and you divide it by the total power being generated inside of the thing, and that's your efficiency. So what are some situations where we would really care about doing this? And I tried really hard to come up with a lot of examples, but to be honest, LEDs is the only context I can think of where this is really a thing. And the antennas here are kind of a sort of example of that. Uh, for example, you know, in transmission line theory, you'll have a transmission line with some load here, and you're trying to match the load. And in the case of an antenna, that's that load would be you know, energy actually kind of leaving this thing in the form of light, say. So, kind of a stretch to call it light extraction, but it, it kind of works. Um, but LEDs are really going to be the situation where we care about this the most. So as a little background on why LEDs are interesting, uh, I find it helps to just start with a simple baseline thought experiment of our classic tungsten film light bulb. <laughs> so how do you typically create light? Well, at least 20 years ago, how did we typically create light? So you, you would start with this little evacuated bulb, and you would run an electrical current through this filament, which is usually made out of something like tungsten. And that, since it had some finite resistance, it would start heating up. And then by Planck's law of black body radiation, it eventually gets so hot that some of the in, uh, energy leaving that in the form of photons starts entering the visible spectrum. And you see that as a distinct glow. So this is... Planck's black body spectrum here. You notice the units are in spectral radiance, so it's watts per square meter per nanometer per steradian. <clears throat> so that there's some wacky reasons for that unit. Uh, the best way to think of it is you have maybe a point source in the sky or a distributed source like the sun, so it occupies some sort of solid angle and it has a spectral density to it and it gives rise to a power density per square aperture is kind of the idea. So that's sort of where that units are coming from. So at 3,000 Kelvin here, you get this particular spectrum. I calculated it all myself. And what's interesting is this is all just energy being released in the form of photons underneath this curve. But only this little sliver of it from about 400 to 700 nanometers is the visible spectrum. So what that means is you have all this energy just being blasted off into space, and you can't do anything with it. You can't see it. It's just basically a glorified space heater. And this is the actual energy that we care about in terms of lighting our homes. So all things being equal, you have an 8% efficiency with a light bulb like this. Now, in reality, it's not even that simple because your eyeballs are not uniformly sensitive to this spectrum. You know, they are more sensitive to some wavelengths than others, which means the same amount of energy at one particular wavelength may appear more or less bright to you subjectively than other wavelengths. So in reality, that 8% is probably more like 4 or 5% if you factor in just the sensitivity of your own eyeballs and the relative perception of brightness. So obviously, this, this could cause some trouble. Uh, for example, you know, light bulbs, lighting, is one of the most, a very dominant source of electrical usage on the grid. Um, you know, just in this room right now, you see light bulb, light bulb, light bulb, and a projector here. 
And this is probably occupying 50% or 90% of the electricity in this room right now, maybe not counting all the laptops everywhere. Um, so if you can make this little process of just lighting things more efficient, you actually take a very large bite out of our total sort of national electricity consumption. Um, you know, if you really want a dramatic example of that, just go to like Times Square in New York, where there's just billboards and lights everywhere, or in say Las Vegas on the Strip, where there's just lights and lights on more lights. Uh, so in the last 20 years, there's been kind of a push to make just lighting more efficient. Because so much energy is just you can see right here off the bat, it's terribly inefficient, and we could take a huge chunk out of our electrical grid if we rethink this a little bit. <laughs> so for that reason, light emitting diodes have been all the craze lately. You know, first you have like fluorescent bulbs, and then there's like the halogen bulbs, and so on and so on. But really, light emitting diodes are kind of the holy grail in this regard for a number of reasons. <clears throat> in particular, here's a here's a nice little picture showing the anatomy of an LED. You see again, it's a semiconductor with p-type, n-type electrons and holes just kind of flying into each other. They recombine. And there's a very fixed band gap energy here, such that when the electron falls into the hole, a photon comes out at exactly that energy. So there's really no wasted energy in this process in principle. You know, and the reality is a little more complicated, but for all kind of practical concerns, this is a very efficient process. So in particular, because this is a fixed energy, so there's a fixed wavelength, so we don't have all that lost energy in photons out of the spectrum that we care about. So that's just one reason why LEDs are amazing. Some other interesting facts, uh, you can tune the band gap here. So depending on how you play with the semiconductor physics here, you can make this a little bigger or a little smaller of a band gap, which means the perceived color of the light coming out of this thing can actually be fine tuned. So that's how we get red, green, and blue, and white LEDs. So that's really cool. Um, <clears throat> another fun fact is they can be modulated at a very, very high speed. So not only are they great for just lighting your room, you can use them to send digital information. So, for example, if I need to send bits from one, one place to another, you just have to take this thing and turn it on and off very, very quickly. So for LEDs, the rise and fall time of a, something like that would be measured in the order of, say, nanoseconds to microseconds. Whereas you imagine here a tungsten bulb, how fast do you think you could modulate that by turning it on and off? Uh, so you're limited by the fact that this has to physically heat up and cool off every time you cycle the thing. So you have maybe tens to hundreds of milliseconds per cycle with this. So the absolute best bit rate you could get on something like a light bulb is maybe 50 to 100 bits per second, whereas this is all of a sudden you're at megabits per second. Um, so they're, they're great to manufacture. Um, so you know, these things are technically only a few cents a pop, very cheap. And of course, efficiency is a big, big deal. So what's really cool here is this is kind of like the opposite of a solar cell, isn't it? Remember, a solar cell is a glorified PN junction where light came in and ex excited the electron into an uh, elevated energy state, and then you did work. Or you can do the exact opposite, where I put in work, and I shove electrons in so that they recombine and create light. And that's kind of a fun thing about physics lately, is this time symmetry. So if you want to get really sort of meta, there, there's a lot of physicists kind of looking at that, because it's sort of this weird <coughs> fundamental property of the universe almost, that all of the laws of physics work equally well backwards as they do forwards. Um, so if you ever go into some extra heavy duty discussions of modern physics, that idea will pop up a lot. But what's also really cool is it means an LED can in principle be used as a solar cell to itself, and I've done it before. Um, any, any good LED, in principle you can shine light back onto it and you'll get the signal out of it, which is kind of neat. So here is what a typical spectrum might look like on an LED. And I've measured stuff like this before. Uh, you can just do it with a simple photometer or spectrum analyzer. Um, this is actually a very standard reference called cool white. So you see it has this really sharp peak in the blue and then this kind of blob in the blue, blue uh, green and red zone here. You also notice it's done right here at 700 and nothing below 400. So for comparison, we'll go back <laughs> it's all contained in that little sliver right here, and there's nothing out here in the spectrum where we don't want it. So right off the bat, this is great because it means we're only emitting light that we want, and we're not creating glorified space heaters out of these things. And there's you can actually like tune this depending on where you go shopping around. 
uh, various LEDs, part of the data sheet, they will show you the actual spectrum of what you're getting out of the thing. And you can just say, no, I want this spectrum. Ooh, that's a nice pleasing color there. And so fun stuff to do with LEDs. Um, so that, in principle, they have a very, very high efficiency in terms of just lighting up our life. Ha, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> With, uh, <laughs> without wasting energy and heating our homes at the same time. So in practice, though, there are some limitations that get in the way. So what we're going to do is sort of another breakdown, like we did last time, of the anatomy of an LED. So remember, last time it was photons came in from on high, and they would enter the uh, semiconductor, recombine to create an electron in the hole. Now the exact opposite happens is electron in a hole recombine here, and I am creating photons that are kind of spewing out in random directions. And ideally, I want those photons to get out here somewhere into the environment. So what are some reasons why this might not be a terribly efficient process? So the most obvious is you've got to be careful about your contact here. So I can't just cover the whole surface of the scene with aluminum, otherwise the photons just bounce around forever and get reabsorbed. So step one. You want to minimize that. And that's why if you zoom in on a typical LED, you see this you know, very sparse grid pattern here to try and minimize that effect. So that's pretty cool. Um, what I should have done was bring in one of my LED flashlights because it has this nice little adjustable lens on it. You can actually see uh, the, the semiconductor image if you <laughs> tune it just right. Um, so that, that's an obvious kind of first step. Remember, we did the same thing with solar cells because, again, I can't trap light if I'm bouncing it off of the metal on the surface. So we want to make this area as kind of transparent as we can. Next thing we want to do is this distance needs to be very, very small. Okay? Because if it's very, very large, some of those photons are going to randomly just find themselves traveling backwards. And they'll hit the back contact and then travel all the way back up again. And there's some finite probability that they'll just recombine with <laughs> something along the way which is bad. So to minimize that effect, we just chop off as much of that as we can and make these things as thin as we possibly can. So right there we have kind of this opposite thing. Remember with solar cells, we want it to be very thick. That's because we wanted to trap light. So now if we want light to not get trapped and get out, we just do the opposite and try and make them very thin. The last problem, though, is this idea of, actually, there's two more problems. So the next problem, we have Fresnel reflections here. So a photon will come up, hit the boundary, and a little bit of it will reflect while a little bit of it transmits through. So that's not too bad. You just add an anti-reflective coating. But then we still have this other problem over here of total internal reflection. So fun fact, an anti-reflective coating will minimize Fresnel reflection, but it will not do anything to stop total internal reflection. So that ray here going up and back down again is completely unaffected by the anti-reflective coating. So that creates a very difficult challenge. Because everything seems nice in, at first, but then you start running the numbers and we run into some very nasty problems here. <clears throat> so here's a quick primer on TIR, total internal reflection. So remember, at any planar dielectric interface, if you're going from low to high, some of that energy will reflect, and some will transmit through, and everything's okay. But if you're going from high to low, so the opposite direction, there is a critical angle where if your ray is outside of it, nothing gets through. And a really fun experiment, in fact, is next time you're in a swimming pool, just go down a few feet and look up, and you can actually see the escape cone above you, where you'll be seeing the world outside, and then everything outside of it will be reflections of the pool back down. So it's really cool to watch that, especially if the water is very still. <clears throat> so adding an anti-reflective coating does nothing to mitigate this little problem over here. Um, this is a fun little graphic I put together once because I did the math on it. It was really cool. So what you're seeing is a line source here. So there's current oscillating in and out of the page and radiating fields in all directions. You can see there's the escape cone right there where some of the energy is getting up and out and the rest just kind of reflecting back down. So this is a nice full field electromagnetic picture of the ray approximation over here. <clears throat> it's a really cool picture, so I take every opportunity to show it off. I work very hard on it. Uh, so let's quantify this a little bit. <laughs> so way back in 2011, 2012, I was working for a startup making infrared LEDs, and we had this exact problem of how do we get light from in here to get out here and there's a little bit of 
literature on the subject. Mostly what they would do is assume isotropic radiation at some boundary and derive some simple numbers after that. Um, but that turns out to not be very useful because when you do numerical simulations, isotropic radiators don't actually exist, per se. Anytime you insert some little current source here, it will have some kind of directionality to it. So that bugged me because I was trying to do all these simulations and I had no way to validate them and, and their efficiency. Because you know? when you set up a simulation, you want to make sure that you've done it properly. So you have to compare it against something with a known solution before you start tweaking the model with your design changes. So this is a paper I cranked out just by doing the math on a directional source, and it turns out to be very insightful into the nature of light extraction. So our model begins with, here is our semiconductor region. It's infinite in length here, and then out here is air, although you could be more generic and just say you know, region one, region two. But for most practical purposes for this model, it's just going to be semiconductor and air out here. So this little source here represents a recombination event between a electron and a hole. And that little event actually can be treated as if there's this moment of current density as the electron itself and the wave function kind of shifts from one state to another. There's a very real flow of current that will radiate light. So if you, um, so like, has anybody taken antenna theory or an advanced electromagnetics class yet? Probably anyone. One guy. <laughs> so if you get into kind of radiation theory and antennas, you, you do a lot of that kind of analysis. The long story short is current density, J, time, time varying current density will create electromagnetic radiation. <clears throat> so that is the electric field, magnetic field. This S vector here is called the pointing vector, represents the flow of real power in that electromagnetic field. So what we can do then is say, okay, imagine a little surface here, enclosing that little current density. I'm going to calculate the flux of that pointing vector, and that tells me how much real power is spewing out of this thing in all directions. So that we call the total radiated power from this little source here. So you notice it's just a surface integral of that pointing vector, which you can calculate from the electric and magnetic fields, which if you know this thing, you can calculate. It's big and it's complicated, but at the very least you can kind of express it in a nice, simple mathematical way. So we're going we're gonna to bury a lot of the details of this under a carpet soon enough, but this is the basic starting point on which to analyze the physics. So next step, what will happen is some energy is going to come up and hit this boundary here, and some of it will get across, and the rest will maybe bounce back down. So to calculate the total radiated power or extracted power into this zone above, you would do a surface integral right here along this plane right here, so you see it's the pointing vector dotted with the z direction. So it's the z component of the power flow. You're just doing a surface integral along this boundary here. Okay? And then you normalize it by the total radiated power, and that is your light extraction efficiency. So it's a little hectic, but it's pretty straightforward to write that down. And it creates some relatively straightforward integrals that you can solve. So Fun fact, this is actually not very useful to do this in rectangular coordinates. So what we're going to do is re-express everything in spherical polar coordinates when we do these integrals in a moment. So for example, let's say for, for argument's sake, there's an isotropic radiator here, which doesn't really exist, but <laughs> we can argue it anyway because it's simple. And so it's just spewing out energy equally in all directions. So that pointing vector will just be constant as a function of radius. And so the total light extraction efficiency will just be the fraction of this solid angle relative to the entire sphere. So basically it's the solid angle of a cone divided by four pi to radians is what you get. So it's a pretty straightforward calculation. You get a nice closed form solution, one minus cosine of the critical angle divided by two here. So that divide by two, I believe, comes from the fact that there's nothing happening down here. So all the energy that goes down is lost forever, and the absolute most extraction efficiency you can get in this model is 50%. So that's where that factor of two, I believe, is coming from. So the critical angle just comes out of Snell's law, and you stick it in there just for kind of an envelope calculation. And what you find is, say, for an index of refraction of three and a half, which is pretty common for semiconductors, crunch out the math, and you get a total light extraction efficiency of less than 2%. <clears throat> so yeah, in principle, semiconductors, 
or sorry, excuse me, LEDs are fantastic for creating all the light in just the little spectrum that we want. But <laughs> this problem of getting the light out of the thing pretty much kills it from the get-go. You're less than 2%. So our task is to figure out how do I get light from in here to just get out there somehow and bring this number back up. So the next step is we say, okay, in practice, there's not really going to be an isotropic radiator. You might have some directionality with this. So again, you can treat this as sort of this infinitesimal moment of current density as the electron recombines with the hole. And that emits photons uh, over every which way. And depending on the orientation of that current density, it will either preferentially radiate this way, but maybe not that way, or however it's oriented in space. So this turns out to have a nice closed form solution. It has a directivity pattern of 3 half sine squared theta. So you notice at, actually, let's see. So I think this is a little backwards. So this is 0 degrees that way. And then, yeah, so if we're in spherical coordinates, up is 0 theta. So then it's 90 degrees here, where it's at a maximum. It goes back to 0 again. And you kind of see that in the uh, electric field profile. So we're going to play around with this model and see, okay, what would happen if we either direct some of the energy up or down or backwards. So we convert to polar coordinates. So this is the rectangular integral along the surface. And you notice we just do it now in terms of angle in polar coordinates here. So that's a pretty straightforward change. This S vector here can now be represented as a gain profile in the radial direction. And then T is used to calculate the transmittance at the boundary. So for simplicity, we kind of keep this at 1, but you can actually throw it in there if you want to get extra precise in your calculations. <coughs> you notice we're normalizing by just 4 times gradients. So let's put in a simple case. You have a Hertzian dipole oriented up, and it's blasting all the energy left and right, and you just put that into the integral. So that 3 half sine squared theta. You let this thing be 1, 3 half sine squared, and you get a pretty straightforward thing that can be calculated. And there's the answer. This big ugly thing, but it's pretty close form, straightforward. Then we can repeat for the opposite case. So that gain is still technically the same, but we just had to rotate all our coordinates around. So that's that little transformation there. And you stick that into the integral and you get this big ugly thing here. Okay? And this is the curve that you get out of it. <clears throat> so this is a fun little. Uh, intuition building graph. Because you see up here, you have the critical angle going from 0 to 90 degrees. And at the top, you have the refractive index that kind of corresponds to that. So obviously, if they're matched, if I'm emitting from air to air, there's no critical angle at all. It's 90 degrees. And my light extraction efficiency becomes 50%. Or in principle, you can put a mirror at the back, and then all these numbers just multiply by 2. <clears throat> and then, of course, as the index of refraction grows up to infinity, you get a critical angle of zero and nothing escapes at all. And then kind of these little transmissions or these transitions between the two. So you can see the, the middle case here was the isotropic, the nice simple case. Then there was the, the parallel orientation, so it's beaming energy into the surface, and you see it's a little better. Then the perpendicular case is awful because all the energy is just being shot sideways, and you get terrible extraction efficiency there. And if you get really motivated, you can account for Fresnel reflection. So AR was anti-reflective. That just means the transmission is 1 inside the escape cone and 0 outside. And then Fresnel reflection, reflection, you have to account for some energy gets out and some reflects back down. It's a big, complicated <laughs> uh, calculation for that, but it, you notice it just kind of tweaks the curve a little bit. Right? And that was a fun paper that I published. It's been cited all but twice in the last six years. I'm very sad about that. <laughs> but if you ever do any sort of analysis like this, that would be a fun paper to cite. <clears throat> so the next step is we say, okay, what is a typical index of refraction for uh, semiconductors? And they're usually between 2.5 to 4. So about from here to here is usually where LEDs tend to live. And you come down and you see, ah, we are somewhere less than 5% on our light extraction efficiency, which is very unfortunate. <laughs> Even if we had kind of a best case scenario here, we're not going to do very well. So as sort of a sidebar tangential story, I have yet to see any analysis on what exactly is the polarization of those electrons and holes as they recombine, because that is determined by you know, the wave functions and their density of states as they hit each other. And there will be some very distinct direction to that uh, current moment. 
and I've seen at least a couple of papers show that there is some distinct polarization that can come out of an LED uh, because of this, and it just has to do with the nature of the crystal lattice uh, where the, the particles are flowing around inside. So that would be kind of interesting to see if you could actually fine tune your crystal to create this particular polarization with your electrons and your holes recombine, because you'd actually get a little extra bump on your light extraction efficiency by doing that. Maybe someone's done that, maybe not, I don't know, but that would be a really fun paper to read someday. Uh, so what the reviewer suggested is, well, that's really neat, but for all we know, it's probably just random. Sometimes they're this way, sometimes they're that way. So what you do is you just sort of uh, average them together, and you actually do get the isotropic case as a sort of randomization of these other polarizations lumped together, but, uh, what's the word, not incoherently, uh, but their phase is not matching together. That's the idea. <laughs> so, anyway, so another fun example is the Lambertian profile, which maybe if I put some surface roughening at the bottom here, remember that the Lambertian profile is a very, very common thing in rough surface scatter. So it has its own little gain profile, which we can then plug into that integral, and you get actually a nice little result of the sine squared times the critical angle. So remember back Tuesday, we borrowed this little expression, and that's where it comes from. You can calculate it using this exact uh, analysis here. So you see up here, since there's a, a mirror at the back, no energy is going down. It's all just scattering up. So you can see in principle we get 100% when we're matched, but we go down here and we're still, you know, barely 10%, which is awful. <clears throat> so this, remember, that's kind of the best case scenario because we had an anti-reflective coating. In practice, if there's some Fresnel reflections, you can account for that, and you see that the red curves are usually about 50% less. So the reality is maybe even slightly worse than we saw. So this just shows kind of the zoom in around the 15 to 20 degrees as most semiconductors would get. So what do we do? So remember last time we had the problem of light was coming in vertically and we wanted it to go horizontally. So we roughened everything up to kind of randomly scramble the directions of rays to get into those specific directions. However, that scrambling works both ways. If I have rays that are kind of going this direction and it hits a surface and I scramble it, then some of it will go back and become up and down. So that little process of scrambling the direction of your rays works just as well no matter which direction we're going. So we're gonna apply that exact same principle <laughs> and just roughen the surfaces maybe at the top or at the bottom of our semiconductor to try and get those straight little rays to start scattering every which way, so that on the off chance, eventually some of that energy will fall into the escape cones and get out here into the environment. So if we do this, how much energy can we extract? So the idea is simply we roughen the surface texture here, and we're going to count on the fact that this is going to just bounce up and down a jillion times, and with each little bounce, some energy will get out, and some of it's going to be absorbed, and we're just going to follow it until we run out of energy entirely. <coughs> So you remember that integral we did last time with that sort of model and slab, and then we're tracking the rays of various directions. So we're gonna ask, what is the fraction of total energy that is absorbed with each bounce? So we have a Lambertian scattering, say, at this surface here. It's gonna spew out a bunch of rays in all directions, and they're all just gonna go down and back up again until they hit the surface. So how much energy is lost in that little step? Well, you just calculate the attenuation of each little ray, and add them all up. So that's the integral here in total spherical polar coordinates. You notice it's two alpha w because of the mirror at the back, so that's where that two comes from. There's that little secant theta term again. Cosine representing our Lambertian source. So remember, absorption is incident minus the transmission, basically. So this is all the energy that made it. So that's, that's the total radiated energy, normalized to one, minus the total of power that got to the bounce back and forth. So you can calculate this as a function of, say, we'll, we'll pick a slab thickness or pick a uh, attenuation constant and graph it as a function of slab thickness here. And this time, not even bothering with any of the approximations, it's crunched on the, uh, the integral numerically. And you get these nice simple curves for various uh, attenuation coefficients. So depending on whatever semiconductor you have, you will have some inherent attenuation constant that goes with it. Most of them tend to fall in this general region around here I understand. So you see, for example, as the slab thickness goes very, very tall, say 100, or very, very small, say 100 nanometers here, your absorption factor is very, very tiny, almost zero, because this thickness is just ridiculously small. It just goes down and back in no time, nothing's lost. 
Then, of course, as your slab gets very, very thick, you eventually lose everything because those rays are all being attenu attenuated. And then there's this nice little smooth curve that transitions from one to the other. So this gives you a nice kind of intuition for if I tell you here is a semiconductor, say gallium antimonide or gallium arsenide or indium phosphide or whatever, it'll fall somewhere on this spectrum here. And you can calculate this graph uh, by just crunching on this interval here. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Is there a is there like an average amount of bounces that it takes for this completely right? We're going to, well, what do you mean average number of bounces? Well, I said like the, can you go back to the sign? Yeah. So the absorb for, for each bounce? Yeah. So like, this is for a single bounce, yes. Yeah, so is there like a, like a yeah. way to describe how many times it stays in there and bounces? Yeah, that's the next step. So um, remember, this is just one bounce, and then we're just going to repeat this over and over and get that infinite series. Okay. But you, so once you quantify the first bounce, you've quantified essentially the infinite bounces after that. So the next step, though, you have to ask how much energy escapes into the environment as opposed to bouncing back down to the next step. So remember, we did all that in the last time where we were a little more explicit about it. We're just going to kind of breeze through a little bit here. But again, it's a straightforward integral. So you have this transmission factor here, which depends on the planar boundary here. Uh, for simplicity, it helps to just... Uh, assume that this is a simple escape cone again. Uh, so in practice, what I should have done with this model is roughen up the bottom and leave the top smooth. It actually would make this calculation a little bit better. Um, so then you would treat this as I have all these rays coming out and they hit the surface. There's an escape cone here where some get out and then some get uh, reflected back down again. And then you see this is now the, uh, it's not exactly light extraction efficiency. I'll just call this like an X an escape efficiency, I guess. But it's basically just the fraction of all the energy getting into the escape cone, um, and all the rest is being reflected back down again. Is the idea. But again, you have to do this little integral in spherical polar coordinates. So I did another little follow-up paper right there to show some of that. And the next step is you just do that infinite geometric series, and you actually get a nice straightforward answer that looks like this. So this is the fraction of energy that leaves into the surface when it hits the top with each individual bounce. And then this is the absorption along the way in between. And so that's just the result out of that uh, geometric series. And you get some nice little results here. So this is a simple case. I think you, know, you have the bottom being roughened and the top is uh, just a flat surface. And I did some simulations. You see where I added like the little uh, cones here to try and get the light to come out. And all that does is just play with these numbers here, depending on your thickness. And in particular, we were interested in gallium antimonide, which is great for me. And at the end of the day, you, know, you have the neat thing about this is you just have two numbers here that you can graph as a function of your thickness, and it's just two integrals that you have to crunch on to get those two numbers there. Okay, so even if you do this numerically using like trapezoidal integration, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. So the take-home point though is that as your slab gets really, really, really thick, you know half your energy just falls out to the bottom, and your light extraction efficiency tanks, and it all just gets absorbed. Whereas if it gets very, very thin, it eventually shoots up and you get very close to 100% of your light extraction efficiency. So for example, a typical wafer of some semiconductor like this might be anywhere between 5 to 10 to 50 microns thick. So you're down here, now you're getting 40 to 50 to 80% of your light extraction efficiency. So it's the same idea of that Neblonovich limit where you're trying to bounce light around to get it to absorb. Now you're trying to get that light to bounce around and eventually get out into space. And you can reach pretty respectable numbers again by following that along. So here are some parallels <laughs> between light trapping and light extraction. So remember with light trapping, our goal was get light into a semiconductor. Light extraction, we want to get light out. So it's the exact same physics. You just run time backwards, essentially. Uh, so we found anti-reflective coding is good. And we also found anti-reflective coating is good. And that's because reflections at that boundary are always going to be bad, no matter which way you're trying to send the light. We also found, where light trapping, we wanted attenuation. We want that semiconductor to absorb as much light as we possibly can. Whereas with light extraction, you want to spit out those photons and never absorb them ever again. So less attenuation, more attenuation. Light trapping. Thick film was generally better, up to a point. Uh, as far as raw absorption of the light, thick films are great, but as far as doing things with your electrons and your holes after the fact, it's not so great. But uh, definitely with light extraction, thin films are a good idea. 
because they maximize the light extraction. But of course, you can't push that forever because that PN junction has to have some finite volume there. And if you make it really thin, then that affects well, kind of how much energy is being emitted per unit area and that kind of thing. So you notice there's kind of these opposite effects here, where thicker is better, but not too thick. Then you have thinner is better, but not too thin. Then <clears throat> the last thing, of course, surface roughening. Surface roughening was good. So the idea here is horizontal or vertical rays need to be scrambled into horizontal. And now we have horizontal rays need to be scrambled into vertical. But that scrambling works equally well either way. So it worked just as well in either case. <clears throat> So that's pretty much all the technical stuff on light extraction that I have. So I like to close again with the pointy-haired boss question. And this is an actual conversation I had with my own pointy-haired boss at some point, was what if we tried to make an LED out of a sphere like this? And you notice if you coat it with an anti-reflective coating out here, every single ray is at 90 degrees, or is normal to the surface, and therefore within the escape cone. Sounds like I've got perfect light extraction efficiency now, right? So the, the game you always like to play, is this a good idea or is it a bad idea? What would you say in response to something like this? I'll let you ponder that for a moment. No comments at all? What, what's your first reaction when you see that geometry? Why would you use an anti-reflective coating on a sphere? Because you are normal, you're yeah. normal incidence to the sphere at all times. Yes, but even if you're normally incident on a, a boundary, you'll still get reflections for no reflection. So if we go back a bunch of slides, and the picture here, right there. So at this boundary, even if you're within the escape cone, you'll get a transmission or reflection. Then the anti-reflective coating gets rid of the reflection, but it doesn't get rid of total internal reflection. So if you're in the escape cone, you can minimize that if you're outside the escape cone. So that's the idea of the sphere. Is everywhere is within the escape cone now in this geometry. <clears throat> so in principle, it should kind of work. There are actually the odd paper or two will pop up. You see people kind of playing with this idea. <laughs> How do you make it? That's the yeah. first question I immediately think as well is, that seems great, but how do you build it? Because most semiconductors, they're really planar. Like all semiconductor device manufacturing really, really loves this kind of planar geometry. And that's because you get you know, the raw semiconductor and you chop into these little wafers and then you deposit things on the top and the bottom of the wafer. So how on earth do you even build that thing in the first place? You need to invent some entirely new process just to physically make it. But let's suppose hypothetically you could. Then what would happen? I guess my question would be, how would you dope it? Where, which, where would the PN junction in this kind of go? Would it just be sort of P here and N here and just kind of half and half? Or <laughs> maybe, so, or maybe, yeah, that you have P on the outside and N on the inside. That, that'd be interesting idea. And like a core shell thing. Like a what? A core. Oh, a core and a shell, shell. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's probably not bad. So then where would the, the contacts go if you do that? So would it matter? I mean, I just have a positive, positive, negative, negative or something. And so now what's interesting though is the current is going to want to kind of flow from one to the other. So will you get a uniform flow of current through everything or will you get like these hot spots where photons are created? No, right? I don't know. Uh, the other question I would have is, oh, another comment? Oh, you could get rid of the contacts by using, like basically uh, inducing those antennas and electromagnetic waves. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> kind of like you would for uh, this squirrel cage motor or something. Well, this is a semiconductor, so we need to get electrons and holes to recombine at a band gap. So is that what you, how do you do that? Will that work? <laughs> Does that have anything to do with it? Can you do that with semiconductors, is what you said? Another question would be, what if my recombination event was over here somewhere? Or does all of my PN junction recombination have to happen in the center? So if it was off over here, then what would happen? Yeah, all of a sudden, so I have my escape cone here, but now I'm sort of falling outside of the escape cone at different angles here. So I start losing that light extraction efficiency if I'm sort of close to the edge 
here. So it really only works in a narrow region inside, and it gets worse as you move away. So hypothetically, yeah, if you can have all the magic happening here, it could work. But if you're recombining things out here, it wouldn't work so well. So that would probably play havoc on your ability to just concentrate energy. Because remember, you have all these electrons and holes have to recombine somewhere. And the more physical space they have to recombine, you get more kind of power density flowing out of it. So that's something I kind of would worry about is maybe you all the electron hole recombinations that have to be focused here. And you have all this, maybe a ratio of like useful semiconductor to not so useful. <laughs> You know, would that necessarily be a bad thing? And then, of course, there's the obvious question. I brought this up last time. Is in principle, you can get like 80% right here if you just carefully engineer a nice planar system with the infrastructure we have. So the absolute <laughs> most you could possibly gain out of this is maybe another 20% of efficiency on just your like extraction efficiency by doing this at best. So again, why would I go through all this trouble to make something like this when if I really care about that 20%, I can just make my little semiconductor 20% bigger or just drive it with 20% more current and live with that? <clears throat> so there's always that question of, yeah, it, in principle, it's a great idea, but I can achieve the same result using this right here. Just make you know, this area, you know, add another 20% off the side, and its brightness will be just as good. Do I really care about that little 20% of my thermal efficiency? I don't know. So that, that is, I just love these little thought experiments because they come up all the time. And every now and then, somebody does come up with something like this that's really bizarre and wacky. And it turns out to be a great idea. <clears throat> but nine times out of 10, you look at that and you think, oh, that'll never work. It's a good thought, but eh. <laughs> These are all the prices you'll have to pay for. But every now and then, maybe this will be a great idea. So that, that's how I like to close <laughs> the lecture on those sorts of thought experiments. Because I, I like, especially like, because I did have this exact conversation with one of my old bosses. And it's just one of those moments where you're sitting down and you start playing what if. You know, yeah, we're doing this thing and we're trying to make this invention. What if we do it this way? What if we do it that way? And every now and then you stumble on, stumble on something brilliant, but usually maybe not. So. <laughs> Right, any questions on light extraction or light trapping now? So, and that was a little bit shorter because we did all the basic analysis. Yeah. Going back then, you just did a hemisphere. A hemisphere? And a reflexive body. That is not necessarily a bad idea. Um, I think would, that would may have been would tried. Get, like uh, electrodes in and stuff. Uh -huh. it easier to... I think people have maybe played with that idea and tried it. Yeah, that's... Uh, common way of making things. I got a uh -huh. bunch of LEDs for the lab. Almost all of them come in hemispherical lenses. Yeah, so the yeah. lens of, on top actually will be a hemis hemisphere. So it's not just that you'll see semiconductor and air. You'll have semiconductor, maybe an anti-reflective coating, and then a big giant dome yeah. of a lens on top of that. <clears throat> but that's usually to focus the light in a particular direction. It has nothing really to do with the extraction. Of it. <clears throat> Which is a whole other problem is just because I'm getting light out here, is it really going where I want? Do I want it just radiating every which way? Or do I want to focus it into a nice little beam? So then you have all that fun optics on top of that. So usually you'll see, say, a big lens on top, like a hemispherical lens. And then you'll have like a big parabolic reflector around it to really just focus on this type of beam. So that stuff's pretty straightforward. Any other fun questions? All right. And then that's all I got for today. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> That's thank you. Right. Let me stop the recording. There you go. Mm -hmm. yeah,